Okay, it's over to Sean for lecture number three in the series Marx, Hegel and Dialectic. Many thanks, Paul. Uh, you know, thanks again for organising these. And um, I'm amazed at how many people have showed up to what is, uh, you know, lectures on, a, I would have thought, an extremely obscure uh, topic. And I'm very grateful to you all uh, for coming along. Um, this lecture, the lecture today, um, which is about the role of contradictions in the development of thought, um, is very much follows on from uh, my previous lecture, though I, though I also hope and I think uh, that it will be uh, quite comprehensible uh, to you if you didn't hear uh, the previous lecture. But if there are any problems that, are, that, that arise, then please, you know, we'll have a discussion period afterwards. Please do feel free to ask uh, questions that may be about what, what, what I said before. Okay, so the role of contradiction in the development of thought. The theme of my last lecture was mainly negative. Even though the law of non-contradiction has a limited sphere of validity and application, I argued, it is not the necessary principle of reason that it is so often claimed to be. It is wrong to see <clears throat> the contradictions which arise in the development of scientific thought in a purely negative way as mere defects and errors to be eliminated. Contradictions are necessary and essential for the development of scientific thought. They play a positive role in it, which must also be recognized. And it's one of the strengths of the dialectical outlook to be aware of this. However, the philosophy of dialectic goes further. It sees a greater role for contradiction than this, as I've stressed, it maintains that all concrete things are contradictory and a unity of opposites. And so a true and correct account of reality must portray it as contradictory. A dialectical account of reality will involve contradiction then not only negatively in the form of the problems and anomalies with which it will inevitably be confronted, but also positively in the very way in which it describes its object. Contradictions in thought appear in a negative form as problems and difficulties, when the basis of these contradictions is not recognized or understood. What dialectic seeks to do is to comprehend the contradictions which really do exist in things and in the process of thought itself, so that these contradictions no longer appear in a negative form, but rather as leading to positive uh, as leading to positive additions to knowledge. To comprehend a contradiction involves understanding its basis, resolving it into its ground, as Hegel puts it. This does not mean eliminating or eradicating the contradiction but rather locating each of its antagonistic aspects as moments, in Hegel's language, of a larger unity or totality, as moments of a process which includes them both and in which they are preserved. In my last lecture, I discussed an example described by Lakatos, the, uh, uh, the Aryan uh, philosopher of science who worked at the LSE in which a newly discovered, he describes a situation in which a newly discovered planet deviates from its predicted path. This is in fact what happened in the 19th century after the planet Uranus was first identified. Its past de deviated from what was predicted by Newtonian mechanics. Astronomers at the time did not treat this as a refutation of Newton's theory, as Popper's philosophy suggests they should have done. Instead, as Kuhn implies, they treated it as, an, as what Kuhn calls an anomaly. And using Newtonian principles, they considered various hypotheses that could account for the deviation. Among these was the, the, the idea that they might be a hitherto unknown planet that was perturbing the path of Uranus. John Cooch Adams in England 
and Urbain Le Verrier in France both made predictions about the possible position of such a planet. And its presence was established by observations by Gala in Berlin in September 1846. In this way, instead of treating these observations of Uranus as simply contradicting and refuting Newtonian mechanics, they treated them as anomalies and using Newtonian mechanics, they sought their ground, which they found eventually with the discovery of Neptune. The fundamental idea of dialectic is that all things are in a process of change and development and that contradiction is at the root of such change. As I've emphasized, dialectic rejects the traditional logical principle of non-contradiction. When dialectic think, talks of things being contradictory, it does not mean that they are impossible or non-existent. To say capitalism, for example, is a contradictory social form, does not mean that it cannot or does not exist, but rather that it is a form of society that involves inescapable conflicts, and therefore it is an, it is an historical and transitory form of society. Likewise, to point to contradictions in a scientific theory does not necessarily entail that it is meaningless or false, but it does mean that the theory contains within itself conflicts and tensions which will result in its further development. The philosophy of science must comprehend these contradictions if it is to be adequate to the reality of science. Similarly, the social sciences must comprehend the contradictions of capitalism and the, nature, and the natural sciences, the contradictions of nature. The traditional logic of non-contradiction disregard, sorry, regards contradictions as repugnant to reality and to rational thought. Dialectic, by contrast, argues that contradictions must be acknowledged to exist as real features of nature, society, and thought. It represents the attempt to recognize and comprehend the contradictions which manifest themselves in things. A full explanation of how the philosophy of dialectic applies to natural and social sciences uh, lies considerably beyond my present scope. However, in the specific area that I'm now talking about, namely the development of scientific thought and the account of it which is given in the philosophy of science, I will indicate how the dialectical account may be justified. In other words, I'm now going to argue that an understanding of the development of scientific thought requires a comprehension of it in dialectical terms, in terms of contradiction. Now, in criticizing Popper's attempt <clears throat> in my last lecture to make the law of non-contradiction the basic principle of scientific method, I relied heavily on Kuhn's arguments, but now I want to consider Kuhn's own philosophy in a more critical light. I suspect that Kuhn <clears throat> would not be happy, would not have been happy, I should say, with the use that I made of his arguments, and still less with, less with the conclusions I'm trying to draw from them. A fuller consideration of Kuhn's account of the nature of science reveals that it too relies very heavily on the law of non-contradiction and that Kuhn is very far from wishing to question and reject this as a necessary precondition of rational thought. According to Kuhn, all established scientific work essentially involves the use of what he calls a paradigm by which he means the constellation of theories and methods, which a scientist uses in the investigation and understanding of the area of reality with which he is concerned. Kuhn argues that all empirical data of science must be interpreted and understood in the light of a paradigm. For according to him, there is no such thing as the direct and immediate experience of nature. A paradigm functions 
as what he calls a worldview. All the data of science are necessarily filtered through it and in the process affected and altered by it. For Kuhn, a paradigm is not the product of experience. On the contrary, it is our paradigm that determines how we interpret our experience and what we see in it, what we see it as revealing of the world. The data of science are not, therefore, something given immediately in experience. They are something constructed, a product of the paradigm, the interpretation, the worldview that we bring to bear on it. Thus, scientists with different paradigms see the world differently, even when confronted with the same situation. The Ptolemaean astronomer, Kuhn argues, sees the sun, <clears throat> sorry, the, the Ptolemaean astronomer sees the sun circling the earth, whereas the Copernican sees the earth revolving around the sun. And according to Kuhn, this is not just a matter of each receiving the same sensory data, but interpreting it differently. In some sense, Kuhn wants to argue, scientists with different paradigms see and even live and practice in what he calls different worlds. He says, and I quote, the proponents of competing paradigms practice their trades in different worlds. Practicing in different worlds, the two groups of scientists see different things when they look from the same point in the same direction. And he goes on, after Copernicus, astronomers lived in a different world. Here we have the picture of a paradigm functioning as a systematic set of assumptions about the nature of reality, in accordance with which particular methods of investigation are devised and data interpreted. According to this view, no particular experience or experimental results simply as such as any automatic and infallible authority or claim to truth. Every experience and the results of every experiment must be interpreted before it can be accepted as data and indicative of fact. The criterion for such interpretation, according to Kuhn, is how well the putative data fits in with a paradigm or worldview with which we are operating. Experience which coheres is accepted as fact, while experience and experimental results which are discrepant are regarded as problematic or anomalous and laid aside for further investigation. Kuhn says anomaly appears only against the background provided by a paradigm. Now, according to Kuhn, coherence and non-contradiction then with the existing paradigm is the criterion by which data is accepted as, as data within a scientific system. An anomalous experience is identified as such by its non-coherence. The crucial role then played by the principle of non-contradiction in Kuhn's theory is now apparent. It is also apparent now <clears throat> uh, that Kuhn's account of science is in a familiar and well-established philosophical tradition, for it bears unmistakable similarity to accounts of knowledge based upon what's usually called the coherence theory of truth, as developed by idealist philosophers in the 19th century. According to Kuhn, Knowledge cannot rest on a foundation of indubitable and immediately given experience. Instead, our experience must be judged by how it coheres with the rest of our picture of reality. F. H. Bradley, the British uh, Neo Hegelian, for example, expresses similar ideas when he writes, and I quote at some length, he said, Bradley says, My experience is solid so far as it is system. My object is to have a world as comprehensive and coherent as possible. And in order to attain this object, I have not only to reflect, 
but perpetually have to have recourse to the materials of sense. Now it is agreed that if I am to have an orderly world, I can't, cannot possibly accept all facts. Some of these must be relegated as they are to the world of error, whether we succeed or fail in modifying and correcting them. And the view which I advocate takes them all as in principle fallible. Facts are for it true, we may say, just so far as they work, just so far as they contribute to the order of experience. That's Bradley. Well, this account of scientific knowledge gives rise to a serious problem for Kuhn, of which he does not seem to be sufficiently aware. For these epistemological views are incompatible with the very interesting and suggestive, suggestive accounts of the historical development of science, which Kuhn also gives. According to this, scientific development occurs through the accumulation of anomalies, which are engendered in the course of normal scientific activity and which eventually lead to a crisis, the theory, and at last to a, a scientific revolution. It's a strange paradox, therefore, that his own account of knowledge tends to rule out the very possibility of such discrepant and anomalous experience. If our knowledge is a construct of our interpretation, if our data is a product of the paradigm we bring to bear on it, then the data of experience and the results of experiment must always and necessarily conform to our theory. If paradigms create their own worlds, as Kuhn says, the very possibility of discrepant or contradictory experience is excluded. Different worldviews are, as Kuhn puts it, incommensurable. If Ptolemaean astronomers, who believe that the Earth is at the center of the planetary system, live in a Ptolemaean world, how can they ever escape from it? How can anomalous experience ever arise for them? And how can the Ptolemaean paradigm ever come into crisis? Given Kuhn's own account of the matter, these things would seem to be impossible. And so too, therefore, the idea of an anomaly, a scientific crisis, and the mechanism of scientific change, which Kuhn describes. In other words, Kuhn's epistemological views lead to the conclusion that each period of science is hermetically sealed up in its own self-created and self-enclosed universe, immune from any external counter-evidence or criticism. And the development of science is rendered into a series of incomprehensible, arbitrary, sudden, and absolute changes of worldview. These, at least, are the implications which follow from Kuhn's view that the proponents of different paradigms, as he puts it, practice their trades in different worlds. However, thanks to the fact that Kuhn neither consistently maintains this view, nor consistently follows out its implications, his account of scientific development is more interesting and worthwhile than it otherwise would be. Kuhn's account of the nature of science would be a more consistent one if he abandoned the notion of anomalies and crises, and with them his account of the mecha mecha mechanism of scientific change. A simplistic structuralist account of this sort is proposed by Althusser, Louis Althusser, the Marxist philosopher, whose epistemological views resemble Kuhn's in other respects as well. Althusser, unlike Kuhn, gives no account of the mechanism of scientific change. He portrays scientific development as made up simply of a series of arbitrary and incomprehensible, what he calls epistemological breaks or discontinuities. Outer's philosophy is certainly the more consistent in this respect, but it is also, I think, the poorer for it. For Kuhn's account of anomalies and their role in the development of science is one of the most valuable and important aspects of his work. And this inconsistency 
in his philosophy is therefore a product in part of his good sense of the process of the historical development of science, a sense almost entirely lacking in altruism. The same is true of many other recent structuralist thinkers, it seems to me, such as Foucault, Rorty, and Derrida. The account of scientific knowledge given by Popper and by Kuhn, accounts, I should say, shed light on the nature of science. And yet each is ultimately unsatisfactory. Each, in its own way, gives a one-sided account of scientific method. <clears throat> Scientists work with a theory and with methods guided and determined by that theory. They put the theory to work in practice and observe the results. On this much, Popper and Kuhn are agreed. According to Popper, if the results of experience contradict the theory, the theory, as Popper says, refuted and must be altered or abandoned. Kuhn, by contrast, rejects the one-sided emphasis of such empiricism, which gives experience absolute authority over theory. The facts, according to Kuhn, are not immediate and infallibly given in experience. The results of observation and experiment must be interpreted. If re reality, as revealed through experience and practice, fails to conform to the expectations generated by theory, then, according to Kuhn, there is a problem, a difficulty, an anomaly for the theory, but not automatically a refutation of it. If scientists simply rejected a theory whenever it was contradicted by experience, science would rapidly come to a halt. For part of the essential process of science is the questioning and criticism of experience and of immediate appearances. Scientists must reject certain data of experience and apparent facts of observation as false, as errors or as anomalies in the light of theory and in the light of other observations. Kuhn is right about this. On the other hand, we must avoid the opposite extreme of Kuhnian style, what I could call rational, Kuhnian style rationalism, which gives theory an absolute authority over the data of experience. For according to Kuhn's theory of knowledge, the facts are not given in experience. They are the constructs of theory. This account too renders science impossible. An equally essential part of the process of science is the questioning and criticism of theory by confrontation with the results of observation and experience. Theories must be tested against reality through experience and the results of practice and criticized and modified in the light of it. But if the data of experience were a mere product of theory, then such testing would be impossible. And scientific theories would be self-enclosed dogmas impervious to criticism or change. In order to avoid each of these unsatisfactory extremes, we must recognize that knowledge is a process, a process involving the interaction, the mutual action, both of experience on theory and of theory on experience. In the process of knowledge, theory is used to interpret, to criticize, and to negate experience. And experience is used to correct, <coughs> negate, and develop theory. The process is two-way and dialectical. In it, there is a continual dialogue and interaction between experience and theory practice and theory. Each tells and con contributes to the development of the other. Knowledge consists of the unity, the interaction, the interpenetration of these opposite aspects. In other words, knowledge is a process during the course of which experience contradicts theory and theory contradicts experience. 
It is a process which is essentially involves the contradiction of these opposite aspects. And it is only in these terms that it can be properly understood. Scientific investigation works with a paradigm. It uses the theory and employs methods which are guided and determined by that theory. It puts the theory to work in practice and observes the results. These observations, these results, are not yet knowledge, but they are the indispensable basis for knowledge. In order to become elements of knowledge, these experiences must be interpreted. Now, there's a strong, strong temptation here to say with Kuhn that the interpretation somehow creates or constructs the data and the facts, but that is false. We should rather say that the interpretation, insofar as it is correct, specifies, determines, and makes us aware of the nature of the facts. Something is revealed by experience immediately and directly. Something has been experienced. But the question of precisely what is not yet decided, not yet known. This is where interpretation comes in. Its job is to determine, to specify, to make conscious and articulate the nature of the object revealed by experience. Until this is done, we have no knowledge. What is given immediately in experience must be interpreted and determined, must be taken up and responded to in a specific way before it constitutes knowledge. As mere immediately given sensation, it is as yet something indeterminate for us. That is to say, we have not yet determined its nature for ourselves in a conscious and self-conscious articulate fashion. We have not yet made it data, not yet made it an element of knowledge for us. Not mean that there is no such thing as immediate experience. It is impossible. It is important to stress. It does not mean that immediate sensation has no specific qualities or that it is something indeterminate and unformed upon which we can impose any concepts and categories we choose. It is wrong to suggest that the interpretation of experience is an arbitrary matter and that we can construct of it any world that we wish. On the contrary, what is given to us by the senses does have a determinate character, even though it has not yet been determined by us, not yet data for us. And even though this character is not known to us until we have characterized and interpreted it. The construction involved in knowledge is not an arbitrary affair. Our inter interpretation must be of the given experience. It must refer to it, be governed and constrained by it. The role of interpretation is not simply to fabricate a world but rather to determine, to specify, to elucidate and illuminate the nature of the world which is in fact given in experience. In this, connect, in this connection, and contrary to the ideas of Bradley and the coherence account of truth, what needs to be remembered is that the aim of interpretation in knowledge is not simply to construct a coherent and formally valid system of ideas, but rather to understand reality correctly and to illuminate and elucidate the object of our experience. <clears throat> Interpretation then is not a purely arbitrary matter. It must be governed and determined by the nature and content of experience. On the other hand, experience cannot provide immediate and absolute foundations for knowledge. And this implies that the character of experience does not entirely determine our interpretation of it. 
Interpretation always goes beyond what is merely given. Interpretation, as Kant argues, is something imposed by us on our experience. It transcends what is given in any particular and finite experience. It involves a priori elements of universality and necessity. However, in this going beyond what is given, our aim is not to invent a merely consistent and coherent theory or to escape refutation. It is to elucidate and illuminate reality. We go beyond present and past experience with our theoretical interpretations in the attempt to anticipate future experience. Our purpose is to understand and reflect the totality of experience and the nature of reality more fully and completely. Interpretation goes beyond experience and never can entirely be justified by or grounded in it. Nor can interpretation be justified by reason a priori in the Kantian manner. There are no infallible forms of interpretation. We cannot know by the use of reason alone whether or not the interpretation, the theory that we have adopted and imposed upon our given experience is a correct one. We have tried with our theory, with our hypothesis, to anticipate reality. But there is no a priori guarantee that we will have succeeded. There is only one way to find out. We must return to experience. We must act upon our theory. We must test it against reality and observe the results. Of course, this new experience in its turn requires assessment and interpretation before its significance can be known. It does not carry the absolute and indubitable authority of a definitive verification or falsification refutation. Moreover, in the course of interpreting and assessing these new observations and results, the theory is developed and extended. This is particularly the case with anon an anomalous and discrepant results. For it is the power of the, of the negative of negation and contradiction which drives knowledge forward. These developments of theory must now be tested in practice and the results interpreted. The new interpretation must then be tested against reality and so on. This is the process by which knowledge develops. We use existing theory to interpret and to determine the significance of our experience and to guide our actions. In the course of them, new experience arises, some of it inevitably discrepant with our expectations, for no theory is perfect. In the process of assessing the significance of this, we develop our theory. These developments of theory must in their turn be acted upon and tested out in experience. In this way, the development of knowledge involves a constant interaction, a constant dialogue between theory and experience, theory and practice. We use theory in order to interpret and assess, to criticize and develop experience. And we use experience in order to test, to amend and to extend our theory. Moreover, in this process of interaction between experience and theory, as I've stressed, neither moment has absolute authority. For on the one hand, as we've seen, we must reject the empiricist view that the data of immediate experience provides an indubitable basis for knowledge, the Popperian idea that theory must be rejected as refuted if it is in contradiction with it. On the contrary, an essential part of the role of theory and interpretation in knowledge is to enable us to make sense of, to bring coherent system and order to the welter of, a, welter of apparently conflicting experiences with which we are confronted.
In the process, we must necessarily criticize and reject some of this experience as insignificant, erroneous, or anomalous. On the other hand, we must equally reject the rationalist and idealist view that our theory, our interpretation, our worldview, our paradigm has an absolute authority over the data of experience. The facts, as I've insisted, are not mere constructs of theory, mere creations of thought. For if the results of experience were mere artifacts of interpretation, then no conflicts between experience and theory could ever arise. Scientific theory would be impervious to criticism or change. In sum, neither empiricism, with its one-sided stress on experience, nor rationalism, with its one-sided stress on interpretation and thought, is capable of providing an acceptable account of knowledge. These either-or extremes must both be rejected. Instead, Knowledge must be regarded as a process involving the interaction, the mutual action, both of experience on theory and of theory on experience. In the development of knowledge, neither experience nor theory in themselves have an absolute and decisive authority. And yet each, nonetheless, has a relative authority and makes an essential contribution. For each can negate contradict, and lead to cha the change and development of the other. Experience requires interpretation, and interpretation needs to be tested in experience, in practice. The result is a continual process of interaction between theory and experience, theory and practice. And knowledge just is this process. It is the dialectical, the concrete unity of theory and experience theory and practice. <clears throat> As I've been arguing, this mutual interaction and conflict between theory and experience in knowledge is not ad adequately comp comprehended by either Popper or Kuhn. The dialectical con account, by contrast, recognizes that this contradiction is essential to knowledge and attempts to comprehend knowledge as the process of this contradiction. The contradiction is acknowledged and preserved in the dialectical account because there is explicit emphasis on the conflict which continues to exist between theory and the results of experiment and their interaction. But the contradiction is comprehended. It is no longer, it no longer manifests itself negatively as a problem or an anomaly. These contradictory aspects are seen to be moments in the development of knowledge. In concrete circumstances, contradictions cannot stand permanently. They lead to development and change. They must be resolved, or rather they resolve themselves. But this, the resolution is not the elimination contradiction. Instead, it is a result, a development, a new thing, something concrete, which is also contradictory, and hence, in which contradiction is reincarnated and repro reproduced. This is what characterizes the development of knowledge. The re resolution of the contradictory aspects of knowledge occurs only through the development of knowledge. However, the contradiction in being resolved in one form is reinstated in another, and hence, uh, it uh, and hence uh, re re reincarnated, reinstated. For example, the contradiction between theory and experience at a particular stage in the development of knowledge may be resolved ultimately by the development of a new theory which comprehends previously anomalous experience within a new theoretical framework. But the new theory, though no doubt more adequate than the old, will in its turn throw up anomalies and contradictions. Thus, the resolution of the contradiction between experience and the old theory does not lead to the elimination of the contradiction between theory and experience, 
Rather, it reestablishes the contradiction on a new and different basis or ground. The contradiction is both resolved and preserved and continues to be so as long as knowledge continues to develop. The dialectical account of knowledge, which I'm outlining here, is, summed up, is sometimes summed up in the slogan that knowledge is the unity of theory and experience or the unity of theory and practice. However, this formulation is one-sided and unsatisfactory. Hegel makes this point in connection with the relation of being and nothing, which he deals with, uh, which I talked about in my first lecture. Uh, he he uh, makes this point as follows. He says, such phrases as being and nothing are the same, or the unity of being and nothing, like all other such unities that are subject and object and others, give rise to a reasonable objection. They misrepresent the facts by giving an exclusive prominence to the unity and leaving the difference, which undoubtedly exists in it, without any express mention or notice. The fact is, no speculative, and by speculative Hegel here means dialectical, no dialectical principle can be correctly expressed by any such propositional form. For the unity has to be conceived in the diversity, which is all the while present and explicit. That's the end of the quote. Knowledge is not merely the unity of theory and experience. It equally involves the conflict, the difference, and disunity of theory and experience, their mutual antagonism. And it is only by re recognizing both aspects, unity and diversity, and seeing the process of knowledge as a contradictory one, that it can be properly understood. To conclude then, scientific knowledge is a process involving a continual conflict, interaction and dialogue between experience and theory. Knowledge, in other words, is a process based, like all other concrete processes, upon contradiction. This is the dialectical account of knowledge. It is in conflict with the traditional logic, logic of non-contradiction. However, as I've argued, this is not a good reason to reject the dialectical account. On the contrary, Although the law of non-contradiction has a limited validity in specifying the principles of purely formal reasoning, the moment the attempt is made, as it invariably is in traditional logic and in the metaphysical philosophy to which it gives rise, to portray this law as a necessary principle of all rational and scientific thought, then it becomes misleading and false. Dialectic, by contrast, with its appreciation of the significance of contradiction, offers a logic of content, a method of thinking which grasps things in their concreteness, and therein lies its power and its strength. Thank you. That's the end. Okay, thanks very much, Sean. Uh, I thought that was extremely thought-provoking. Uh, we now have time for questions and comments. Can I stress that questions and comments are not long excursus from the floor? Uh, can we do this in the usual way, which is to put your hand up and I will deal with people one at a time, starting with Giovanni. Do you want to ask your question, Giovanni? Ah, yes, thank you, Paul. Um, thank you for this wonderful, uh, exciting uh, lecture. Uh, I want to go straight to the point because of my previous physicist background, so um, about Kuhn. In general, about your comments on, uh, I quote, I quote, theory and experience, theory and practice, tested in experience and practice, theories and experience, theories and practice. The result of experiment. Okay, we know that experiments and practice are something very different, I think, because I'm sure that in this audience, 
the Marxist notion of practice is quite far from the physicist notion of experiment. I just want to give a kind of Marxist point of view. So let's speak about money. So there is an experiment that is I touch somebody to see if he has fever, if he's hot, but then with the normal accelerators, uh, you know that they are 100 people and the accelerator cost uh, four billions dollars. So I, I, uh, for me, it's a little bit strange um, that you are co combining experience and practice and also a kind of general view of experience and experiment. Because one thing is an experiment of uh, 100 people, $4 million accelerator. One thing is a finger touching a man to see if he has a fever. And one thing is the Marxian notion of practice, like a kind of interaction between subject, object, world, and so on. Ah, let us quote interviews in sociology. So uh, my feeling was that this uh, wonderful uh, general discussion was a little bit uh, generic in my view. So uh, I want to understand better why you are um, constantly um, um, summing up experience and practice. I mean, practice, uh, do you mean in a Marxian sense or you mean as a kind of synonymous of experience? Because uh, I think they are very, very different topics. And uh, maybe only in quantum mechanics, there is a little bit of combination between experience and practice. Uh, and also one very important thing also about the difference. You, uh, uh, my feeling was, uh, wonderful talk about hard science but what about critical science because uh, i have the feeling that you were speaking about quantum particles uh, because we know that uh, human subjects are very different subjects so if you want to experience with a subject you know that this uh, uh, lay a worker or capitalist will react back, will fight back. It's not a quantum particle. So ju just a, a, a comment about the different topics of science, because not all science are the same. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Sean? Right. Uh, well, thank you very much for that uh, uh, question, those observations. Um, it was very generic. Um, my talk, I agree. I mean, it's philosophy. I'm talking, you know, it's general abstract philosophy. And, uh, you know, I was talking in very, very general terms. But it seems to me that in very general terms, scientific experiments, which are much more organized, which may be much more large scale, are a form of practice. And I don't really accept your uh, the implied view that uh, that somehow the Marxist notion of practice is, is, any, is any different from that. I mean, this is just a particular uh, form of practice, very special form of practice, very organized, very controlled form of practice. But a scientific experiment is a sort of practice. And I think one can generalize uh, in the way that I was trying to do. I don't, you know, it was generic, I accept, but I think that's, legitimate. I think one needs to generalize these things, and I think it's illuminating uh, to do so. That would be my uh, response to that point. I don't think, I think, again, that one can say that the same sorts of generic, very generic uh, principles operate in the social sciences and in our everyday life as operate in the natural sciences. I don't, you know, I think it's very important to argue, and I believe strongly, and, uh, you know, I've argued this in other things that I've written, that you know, the same basic principles apply to uh, the study of society as to the study of nature. I don't, you know, I think it's, um, I think it's, it's a fundamental aspect of uh, Marxism uh, as, a, as a form of, materialism as a form of non-dualism to argue that you know the same principles ultimately apply in the in the social world as apply in the natural world i mean i'll say something a bit about that in my um, final lecture but i mean that's my view so i'm you know i'm, I'm afraid i disagree with you on that point too okay richard falvey uh, hi thank you <clears throat> um I was just wondering, uh, 
if you know McGilchrist's work and if you see parallels between the dialectic you've outlined and McGilchrist's sort of left brain, right brain, and then the need to bring them all together in a in a totality. Um, and then also um, mm. you use the words determined and indeterminate. Uh, I don't I don't know uh, if they were sort of used sort of in a specific way um i was wondering if you could unpack them a little bit the words determined indeterminate and maybe is does the word reductionism fit in with those two as well if you think that's appropriate thank you yes uh, um well let me say uh, left brain right brain um i'm not you know i'm not i mean i've read about it in sort of the popular in popular presentations but i'm afraid i haven't read uh you know any any sort of um um, I, what, I, what I was just about to say, serious presentation. Of it, perhaps that's a bit unfair, but you know what I mean. I sort of, I mean, a, a detailed and and well argued presentation of those ideas. I mean, there's clearly a, a relationship between the, the idea in the sense that here we have a unity of opposites, which is one of the fundamental ideas of dialectic. That everything is a unity of opposites. In that sense, human psychology, I guess, is an example of that. I think where the difference may be, but as I say, I don't know enough about the, the literature here to, um, to, 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 to really know. Uh, but um, I, the, the essential point of the dialectic idea of a unity of opposites contradiction is that it leads to change and development. It's, it's, it's totally, you know, and necessarily associated with the, you know, you, the contradiction unity of the opposites leads to change and development. These, these notions are completely um, tied together. Whereas whether that's true in, I mean, I get the impression that it's more a matter of equilibrium and balance being stressed in, um, in the left brain, right brain literature. But as I say, I don't, you know, I, I don't know. That's my sort of general impression. Um, Determ I mean, determinate and determinate. I mean, I, I could certainly try and explain um, that if you can give me an example of where, where you find it, where you found it puzzling. But I, I try to use those terms in fairly, um, I don't know, fairly sort of ordinary ways, I think. Um, reductionism, I'm, you know, I think that one of the very important features of, uh, of dialectic in it's both its Hegelian and its Marxist form is it's it's non-dualistic and non-reductionist, and uh, I will very much be talking about that that issue in my in my final lecture. But I would you know I I'd say that it's very opposed to reductionism, uh, and uh, I think that's one of its really important um, implications. Okay, uh, Cynthia. Thank you. That was excellent. Excellent. Um, in defense of the general applicability of what you've said, um, I just want to point out to Giovanni, he said that humans are unpredictable. Well, so are particles. And, you know, um, I don't know much about science, uh, but what I do know is that at the smallest level, scientists are dealing with probability, not with absolute. So let's, let's be aware that's true in the natural world of, uh, and it's also true in the um, in the physical world. So that's that. Um, I did want to say, um, and there's one other thing, but I'll come back later. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think that's a very good point. You don't even have to go to sort of um, I don't know fundamental particles to make that point. I mean, if you drop a leaf, uh, it, you know where it will land up is pretty much unpredictable um you know i mean the, i mean it's 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 a very simple thing but uh you know the way it, it drops and, and flies sort of is caught by the wind and so forth it's going to make that unpredictable the weather is you know to a large extent unpredictable more predictable now than it used to be but basically unpredictable um nobody would doubt i think that the weather is a purely physical uh, you know, ultimately a natural, a physical phenomena. There are a lot, as you quite rightly say, I totally agree with this, um, that, you know, it's not just human beings 
behavior, which is unpredictable. Um, so is so a natural phenomena, and and by and conversely, it's not only natural phenomena that are predictable, but also a lot of human behavior uh, is predictable. Okay, thanks a lot, Ruth. Hi, thank you so much, um, and thank you for the lecture. I and for all your work, it's. Uh, lovely to <laughs> kind of meet you <laughs> virtually. Well, well, thank you very much <laughs> for those kind words. Um, I just have a kind of a couple reactions, I guess. Number one, I think that this point, I mean, once you say it, it's it's so obvious that the point, uh, a kind of internal critique or imminent critique of Kuhn, um, that in order to have an anomaly, you really do have to have some some kind of phenomenon with a form of its own, or at least of a form that's not given by the form of the theory. And I think um, that's that's just a terribly important point. So thank, thank you for that. Um, I, I'm a person who thinks a lot about these issues about realism and anti-realism. So just one other really observation and just a general comment is in your contrast between Popper and Kuhn, I think as soon as we agree with you that Kuhn said that kind of stuff, made those kind of sweeping ontological claims about the nature of the, you know, the the, ob the world or the object. Once we dismiss that, either because he didn't always say it or for the point that you made, then I think our attention is really rightly drawn to the difference in the model of theory. So there. There's nothing wrong with saying that a universal generalization can indeed be falsified by a counter instance. Mm. I mean, that, that, the question, the interesting question is, ought our theories take the form of universal generalizations? And the only reason why one would answer that in the affirmative is if they're already committed to, to positivism as an epistemic, um, and and methodological method, but especially an epistemic. Mm. So I think it's important that Kuhn had a richer conception of what a theory is than Popper, who was really working off of a logical positivist conception of what a theory is in the first place. Um, and once we correct Kuhn's ontology in the way that that you did. Um, so I think that's a, wor a point worth adding into the mix that we have to think not just about the relationship between theory and whatever it is, however it is that we're thinking of an object domain, but we have to really at the same time think about the conception of the form of theory <laughs> in, okay. because that affects the, how the, what that relationship is gonna look like. You okay. can't falsify uh, a sure. Yeah. I yeah. think I, I entirely agree with you about that. Uh, but I mean, you know, I think Popper's conception of, of what a scientific theory is, is very, is, is identical, actually, to the, I mean, he came out of the uh, Vienna school. I mean, he was a product of uh, the positivist, um, you know, the whole positivist movement in, in Vienna in, uh, in the early uh, 20th century. All he did was instead of, you know, they said verification, is what uh, 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 confirms theory. He said, "No, you know, ver verification is never, never final. We we've, we've got to go for uh, uh, falsification." I mean, he just—that's the only difference I would say between Popper's account of theory and um, and uh, and the the positivist one. And now, and as you rightly say, and I completely agree with this, these are far too simple uh, pictures. And Kuhn has a much richer. I mean, it's a much more interesting account of any of uh, science, partly because it's, 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 you know, who can study the history of science? I think that's terribly important. Whereas the logic, the positivist or the Papirian view is in almost entirely sort of, is very schematic, right. very um, abstract and philosophical in a way. I mean, I don't like to use philosophical as a as a, as a word of criticism, but uh, uh, it's sort of anti-historical, I think, in many respects, or unhistorical. 
And has, I think one of the great strengths of Kuhn is his sort of historical understanding. And, Sorry. and it just has a super simplistic notion of what an explanation is. And that was just my last point is just, I do think that it's really important that um, these, these issues really um, require a fair amount of specificity in order to, at least in order to deal with like Anglo-analytic philosophy. So mm. that, that's it. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> okay, Rob. Uh, may, may I echo Ruth's thanks for your brilliant lectures and your brilliant work. Uh, and I find your critique of, of Popper and of Kuhn uh, and your picture of the dialectic involved in, in knowledge, uh, the unity of these opposites, the contradiction between theory and practice, very um, compelling. But I had two quick questions. The first is whether what whether you had any thoughts on whether the debate within Anglo-Saxon philosophy recently over the myth of the given and the myth of the myth of the given, particularly McDowell's work interpreting Sellers and that all uh, perception must be conceptualized, put into the space of reasons and the reaction to that in terms of naive, naive realism. Whether you had any thoughts on that and whether you thought that was of any relevance to the arguments you're engaging in. And the second, very quickly, is this, um, I understand how contradiction can drive change uh, in the abstract, but if there isn't, in, in terms of theorizing, a regulative ideal to achieve consistency, what stops you resting at a certain point with contradiction, if contradiction is okay? I, I, I haven't quite grasped that yet. Sorry. Yeah, sure. Um, first of all, yes, indeed. Um, I think that, um, that Sellers, uh, and even more so, McDowell, and people like who've, who've sort of taken up Sellers' uh, work and developed it, are highly relevant. Here, um, I don't think they go quite far enough in, you know, they could be more Hegelian than they are, and then they'd be better for it. But uh, <laughs> I think it's, you know, some of the most interesting work that has been done uh, in the uh, analytic tradition uh, uh, in recent years. And one, and one of the reasons is, I think, that it does link, you know, it does try and make relation with Heidegger, particularly perhaps rather than Hegel, but you know, it's much broader in its in its reach than um than uh than than some other uh well sort of uh, earlier analytical work. Um and uh, and and Brandom of course does does try and draw in Hegel. I mean there is a, a a widening of the horizons of analytical philosophy and that work benefits from that and is all the better for it in my view. So I you know, I think there's you know that that's a very important uh, development and one that I absolutely welcome and would um, you know would applaud and relate to. Um, the idea that you need a regulative principle. I mean, contradictions resolve themselves. I think, or at least they they are themselves lead to movement. You don't need to add any principle here from outside. They they you know I mean they they. they it's a sort of imminent development which occurs because there is contradiction, then there is movement. Um, you know, the idea that somehow we need to introduce movement, make them move, they'll, they'll simply stay there. Uh, I, I mean, I'm using very metaphorical language here, but I mean, uh, it seems to me that contradiction is movement uh, or lead, it, it, it automatically leads to movement. It doesn't need any further principle to push it along. And I think I say that in some of my, uh, some of the, well, I, I definitely do say that in some of these lectures, because that's that's my view. Thanks. Uh, David? Yeah, I, 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 I would like to go back to an issue that we, we touched upon in the previous lecture regarding the skill of holding fast the opposites, because you're talking about the resolution of contradiction, but surely the issue is how we resolve contradiction, because contradictions can resolve themselves spontaneously in nature, be, um, beneath our vision, beyond our reach, because they are unconscious. It's only when contra contradictions are brought into consciousness that we are then posed with the necessity and the tasks of 
holding fast those opposites so that we can manage the transitions and interpenetration, the interpenetration of opposites in our favor in a way in which man can then, uh, you know, empower and, and, and use this skill as, as a tool, as, as an instrument. So I guess my, my question to you is really about the process and practice of cognition in that what concepts and categories do we need to understand and train ourselves to, to use in order to become comp competent dialecticians, in order to train ourselves to, to grasp, contradict, to identify contradictions and to resolve them. Um, otherwise, I think the consequences of not doing that means that contradictions resolve themselves to our disadvantage. Disasters, catastrophes in nature, today's the earthquakes in Turkey, for example. Why weren't the, the warnings, why weren't there warning signs? And if there was evidence that these earthquakes were, were going to going to take place, why wasn't that evidence brought before people? So that, that's my question really, is re the skills of resolving contradiction and the consequences of leaving contradictions to resolve themselves in spite of ourselves. But I mean, yeah, I mean, I think you're right. I mean, I agree entirely that contradictions resolve themselves. I think, you know, that change and development, uh, you know, occur anyway. They're imminent in, in, in things. That's the way things operate. Now, I mean, what we, you know, I'm not sure about, you know, why, you know, warnings. I mean, you know, with some uh, uh, natural phenomena, we don't understand. Um, the contradictions that are involved. I mean, there were tremendous contradictions, stresses and strains, obviously, going on under the Earth's surface in uh, Turkey, which led to the, you know, eventually a, 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 an earthquake. Whether that was, whether there were warning signs that were missed, I mean, there must be warning signs, but we, you know, our understanding of them is pretty you know is very very limited i mean the ability now even with the best will in the world and the best science in the world it seems to me to understand and predict um earthquakes is is still as far as i'm aware very limited mm -hmm. um uh, you know there must be warning signs there must be <clears throat> it must be it will eventually i'm sure be possible to have a much better um uh, 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 prediction of earthquakes than we have at the moment and that will involve understanding the conflicts that are going on within the earth's crust and and being able to um to to sort of uh, anticipate their outcome um now isn't i mean what skills do we need to do that um how do we i mean isn't i mean it seems to me that the I mean, dialectical philosophy, I mean, at least sort of says that's what's needed. Um, I mean, dialectical philosophy is, 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 a, is an attempt to become conscious of those uh, processes and, uh, and, and bring them to, to conscious yes. to thought. Um, and, they, and as I was trying to argue, because I was really arguing about the way contradiction operates in the development of thought. Um, I think to become conscious of how that is operating mm -hmm. is, is you know, I don't, I don't know what more to say than that. But I think dialectical philosophy and its awareness of the role of contradiction is a tremendous um, step forward in, in, in understanding. Okay, we've got three hands up and time is beginning to fall. So brief questions, please. Cynthia, you've already had one go, so I'm going to put you at the back of the queue. Uh, Elizabeth. Hi, thank you. That was very, very interesting. Um, from your elucidation, am I right in thinking that you have allowed um, unresolved um, material to remain outside your sort of, outside the 
the theoretical framework which might make it intelligible as a sort of ongoing dialectical contradiction. What sort of thing do you have in mind there? Nothing particular, ab more abstract. It seemed to me that you were sort of elucidating a uh, reflection of the dialectical method as something where theory is always opposed to the material it would seek to intelligibly kind of um, codify and explain. And that itself was the dialectic. But I mean, uh, well, I mean, there are lots of, you know, I mean, there are lots of, you know, whenever you do a sort of, uh, whenever you try and understand something, or whenever you know science is is at work, you know, there are unres there are problems, there are anomalies. There, I mean, I, you know, it's very, uh, I think it's very illuminating. I found it very illuminating. Should I should say, to see that? I mean, I found Kuhn's work very illuminating. It really did did open my eyes to uh, a much more um, a richer. Uh, understanding of what's going on in the process of science than than you get in you know I mean I sort of grew up with positivism and Popper and I found Kuhn which I just read it as I you know when I became a graduate student um, enormously illuminating um, but his I mean the notion of an anomaly is the idea of an unresolved contradiction of a conflict um, and you know when you do I mean, I did, you know, physics and maths and chemistry in school, and then in my first year at university. And, you know, you, you one of the things you eventually get to, to, to be taught about is the theory of errors, because it is recognized in all scientific practice. Good scientific theory is perfect, and you've got to take account of the, the you know, the you've got to allow for the possibility of error and, and have some idea of how to deal with them. So unresolved um, contradictions, unresolved conflicts in, in, in any area of knowledge are just a fact of life, but, but need to be there. We need to understand that and take them into account. And I think that's one of the great strengths of um, Kuhn's work is that instead of regarding all uh, in conflicts and contradictions that you come to in uh, in understanding as simply errors and and you know things to be just rejected and regarded as 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 refutations and falsifications and so forth. You know, the, uh, Kuhn has he tries to say, look, what is their role in the development of science? And what is you know his is surely his work is about. Precisely what you're asking about about unresolved conflicts in in and contradictions in science. That's what that's what it's about. Okay, Douglas. Yeah, does that? I mean, let me just ask: Is that? Am I understood right? Your question, and does that answer it? You're getting a thumbs up and a, an O, etc. So I think it's in sign language that works. Douglas, do you want to ask a question? Yeah, uh, he. I'm a doctor of philosophy myself, okay, and uh, I think you did an excellent, excellent job there. But it, it's really when we look at science, okay, as factual, okay, and look at it as basic, a fact, okay. I think you know that is hard, hard thing. Even my students, okay, that okay. It's very hard to put science at saying which is going on now and what he was saying uh, to say it's a one hundred percent correct because they keep finding all kinds of other things after okay uh, and every time you say this is a fact and this is the way it is uh, it isn't that way it comes out to be uh, changes all the time um, so. You know, I understand what he was saying, but it's hard to put that in. You follow what I'm saying? It's hard to say that science is 100 percent. It never is. But I like what you said. It was great. I was saying it never is. Mm -hmm. There's always, always, literally always um, errors, uh, anomalies, problems in science. It would cut. It would be complete and scientists could pack up and go and do something else if um you know if 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 it was a hundred percent correct it's never i think one can safely say it's never 
100% correct. There are always problems. I mean, that's one of the illuminating things that Kuhn says. I saw, that's not original to me. I mean, that's Kuhn's uh, argument that there's always, you know, there is no such thing, he says, as scientific investigation without anomalies, without problems. And it's those problems, those anomalies, the negative, if you like, as Hegel would say, that drives science, science forward, that, that leads to the development of science. So it's never, it's never, yeah, absolutely never 100% correct. Sophia. Okay, I'll, I'll be brief. Um, I, for those of us who are interested in applying this to political action, to the transformation of society, um, I just want to speak to the extreme importance of what David said about holding the contradictions. Because um, those of us trained in Western um, intellectual academies don't, you know, don't like contradiction. We can't hold it. And I um, mean, I confront that all the time in my political work, the, that the um, people who should be aware of transformation taking place through contradiction and antagonism um, end up being um, quite sectarian, holding to their own ideas. Anyway, just want to say that that ideology, and I think this is part of what I learned from Kuhn, is that ideology is extremely important in terms of determining your uh, ability to interpret society um, and use the knowledge for the benefit of humanity and change. Thank you very, very much, Sean. It was excellent. Well, thank you very much for those. I mean, and I entire, I absolutely agree with what you've just said, and I found Kuhn illuminating in just the same sort of way. And um, anyway, thank you. Uh, before I hand over to Janet, uh, as indicated, I'm going to abuse the chair and ask a question myself. Uh, and well, not so much a question as observation on some of the comments. It seems to me that there is a something of a conflation of ontology and methodology. If we accept that a dialectical methodology is most insightful as to how change and indeed continuities are manifest in society and in nature. That's not the same, and therefore making a direct correspondence between methodology and ontology. It's not the same as then saying, we know, we can just read this off and talk about Turkish earthquakes or whether one demonstration fizzles out and another one produces widespread up, up, uh, uproar. And in that respect, I think we have to be very careful about privileging a dialectical methodology because it's insightful and then assuming that we are always and everywhere able to actually pick up corresponding knowledge. I think Bad Year is quite good at this in being an event where we almost invariably, although we know with each revolutionary upheaval or protest there is the revolutionary possibility, we often only see the reality of it through the rear view window. Uh, but do you want to now make your point? I'm sorry, I, I don't know what your name is, but your your label is Janet Iphone. Yes, I know. It's actually Janet is my wife's name. My name is Alan, which you is the you second. You can change that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I can't. <laughs> um, I, I just just an, a small observation uh, attendant upon what Sean was saying earlier about the fact that. No science is absolutely infallible, infallible, which obviously most people will accept. But can you add to that as a sort of addendum that not only do we not know everything, but it is possible that we will never know everything. And but even if we were to know everything, we, we wouldn't know it when we reached there. And that's an observation that Plato made. <laughs> yes, I mean, I, I don't, I mean, I think, I think the implication of, um, I mean, I, I, I hesitate to say, I mean, I, I think I would incline to the view that you, we will never know it. We never can know everything. Uh, or, you know, that there always will be 
problems and anomalies and errors in our knowledge, no matter how, you know, how long we go on. I mean, that is, there's an endless, you know, the dialectic of knowledge is, is interminable, is endless. That, that would be my view. I can't, you know, I, that's a sort of metaphysical claim, which I don't, I don't know quite how I'd ever go about justifying that. But, it's... Yes, but he, my, my point is, yes, I agree with you, but we can never know that we know everything. Well, I guess we'd know if 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 we never, you know, we'd never know quite with that we, you know, if we if our new discoveries simply dried up, came to a halt. Theories never, de you know, we never encountered any problems. It never never developed. Then, uh, um, I guess, but we'd never know that, you know, tomorrow uh, a problem wouldn't show up. So, in a way, I agree with you there as well. Thank you. Can I just respond briefly to, to Paul's point, as I, as I understand? Um, method, I mean, surely it seems to me that methodology and ontology must ultimately align. Um, that, that, I'm mean, a sort of realist. I believe that, you know, the, a methodology works because it has the right understanding of reality. And uh, you know that would be my, I think my my view. I mean, they may misalign at certain times, obviously, but ultimately, you know, they've got to come into alignment. If the methodology is working, it's because it has a correct understanding of the reality that it's dealing with. So I'd want to always try and keep those two, at least, you know, in ultimate uh, alignment. Yeah, I mean, I. I mean, that's my point, they are. But I think there's a distinction between saying that as a general principle of our understanding and knowledge and recognizing that the way we operationalize, acquire and use knowledge is not always and not anywhere near as perfectible as that relationship, which is why- Yeah, no, I, I'd agree with that, certainly, yeah. Which is why there are gaps of, as much as errors, as much as not seeing, as much as recognizing that part of the problem of theory and practice is we practice in different contexts and conjunctures, different yes. cultures and you know manifestations of being different parts of the life course, which I'm acutely aware of as I get older. <laughs> yes. so let me last comment. So Sean, would you like to make a last comment? Um, well, I'm very glad that, uh, you know, I found this very interesting and helpful as a discussion. And uh, I'm very pleased that so many people have come and they're so appreciative of, of these lectures. Um, I'm, I'm honoured. Okay, well, if we have no one else, our next session, uh, we had to move them from a pattern. Because as most of you know, in Britain, the uh, higher education unions are striking for 18 days this month and next. So our next session is on a Saturday afternoon, uh, which I think is a perfect time to relax with a bit of philosophy. Uh, okay. So we hope you'll be able to join Sean then for his fourth lecture. We then have the following Monday and the following Friday and on Friday the 17th, it's the last lecture. Uh, I will say again, recordings of all the lectures will be available, uh, but don't expect them in the next couple of weeks, as there are other jobs I've got to do before I put them online. Okay, thanks very much. <laughs>